I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to The Bigfoot Project. My name is Robert. A few years ago, I want to say around 2013, I had a couple experiences with these monsters. And I do mean monsters. Tackett Creek, Tennessee has always been somewhere where my family hunted or dug ginseng. All my life I visited the area at one time or another and had never felt uncomfortable in any way until that summer. I had just started a new relationship with this little gal I knew, and we'd go four-wheeling in my truck in those woods, doing the little things that couples do, of course. One night, we had a little bit of an experience as we were wrapping up and getting ready to leave our particular spot, which we frequented. We heard coyote howls, but nothing like they usually do. It was frantic. It ended quick with one yelping like it had been kicked in the ribs. Spooked us, so we got the hell out of there. As we drove down the hill, we noticed eye shine about 25 feet up a bank to the left. I thought it was an owl until she screamed that the moonlight showed a huge man-like body. We got the hell out of there ASAP. I went back the next day with an arsenal, of course, and found tracks. And where this thing was standing and where the eyes were, it had to be eight feet tall. A week or two after that, I told my uncle what had happened. He had been camping and ginseng digging in the mountains and ridges above where we had been. His camping trip had been a few days after our experience. He said something had tried to come into his camp at night, and his dog was terrified. The next morning, he found a skunk skin that had been shredded and was hanging on multiple trees like it had exploded. Anyways, I called a couple of friends and we decided to do a night Bigfoot hunt in Tackett Creek where this happened. Well, the area. I called these guys, Tweedle and Dee, to protect them. One's a law officer, and the other has a really good job to preserve. So we plan it out, and we go up there, and start where me and my girlfriend had our experience. We call blasted, tree knocked, nothing, but it was really quiet, so we call it a night. I lead the way in my truck. This mountain is huge. It takes about 20 minutes to crest the top from where we were at in the bottoms. I'm making some time out of there, and there's some distance between our vehicles. I crest the top and get on the other side, about 200 yards, and I see them flashing their headlights in my rearview mirror. So I stopped. I'm on one hell of an incline, in the middle of an old gravel mining road, with straight-up mountainsides on both sides, and huge wash to the right at the bottom of said mountainside. I put the emergency brake on and turn off my truck and wait. When they pull up, they start asking me if I was whooping as I drove out my windows. I hadn't, but they thought I was BSing them. So Tweedle decide to call blast as D stands there with his AR-15. The very second after he blasts, something roared from the wash to the right. It's very heavily wooded and a huge thicket in this place. Then whatever made this unearthly roar tore through the thicket and up the mountain, and it sounded like a herd of rhinos doing it. The roar itself was incredible. It felt like it vibrated every bit of my insides. Nauseated me and terrified me at the same time. Scared both those guys to death as well. We jumped in our vehicles and got the hell out of there. We met up at the edge of town and we all decided that we didn't know what it was and that none of us was going back. I've since moved out west, but I never hunted or dug ginseng there afterwards. For years, I've been trying to figure out what I saw back in the late 70s when I was 14 or so. My father and I would quail hunt in a remote area above Oroville, California, called French Creek. One day, myself, Dad, and a friend of Dad's drove a few hours on rough dirt roads into a location adjacent to one of the many fingers that spread from the Lake Oroville. We parked and hunted a few hours before we met back at the truck for lunch. All morning, I felt like I was being watched. I just knew someone was behind me, but I didn't see anyone. Later that morning, a deer jumped from the vegetation, so I attributed that feeling to it. We met back at the truck, and we ate our lunch. I was standing in the back of the truck looking over the cab, focused straight down the road. To my left was the finger of the lake, north fork of the Feather River. I could hear, but not see, someone faintly talking. A fisherman, I guessed. The build-up roadbed where we parked sloped on both sides with a heavy rock base, more so on the lakeside. At the moment I heard the fisherman, as I was looking forward and from my left, 
I saw something step up from the bushes onto the road about a hundred yards in front of the truck. In profile, it seemed tall and to have a light-colored flowering dress on. This is the first thing that popped into my head. I remember thinking, why is that guy there and why is he wearing a dress? Staring at the image, I realized what I was seeing was long, light-colored white hair flowing and moving and that it was not a man. At that distance, it looked very out of scale, way too big to be a man. Heavy shoulders, long white hair covering the body, and no noticeable neck. At this point, I turned to my father to ask if he was seeing what I was. He was absolutely focused on what was happening in front of us. My father is a quiet, tough sort of guy, and has hunted all of his life. The look on his face made me think something was wrong. I could tell from his eyes, I don't know why I understood this, that he was in a fight-or-flight kind of mode. He was trying to make a decision. As I looked back, I could not make out a face. I think it was looking over its shoulder directly at us. It then took two strides and stepped off the opposite side of the road, disappearing into the same area we were hunting earlier. At that point, my dad said the day was over and we were heading home. He loves hunting and he would never leave early for home. That really set this memory for me. My dad was in flight mode. Later, as we drove home, he kind of chuckled and asked what we thought about the crazy hippie we saw. I don't remember what I said, but I did realize why I had the feeling of being watched. I think the creature was watching the fisherman from the riverside bushes just before he stepped out onto the track. But I also think that means he was watching us earlier in the morning. To this day, my dad, who's 81 years old now, brings up the crazy hippie once in a while. I know it was no hippie. Other people tell stories of seeing a white Bigfoot in the same area. Don't know what I saw, but it could have been a Sasquatch. I'm 53 now, and I remember this pretty clearly. I'm sure there are some things that have faded, but it has to have affected me, because every time I think about that day, I get a chill, like I am right now. Thanks, Matt. My name is Richard. When I was about 12 years old, my father had enough confidence in me to allow me to wander the forest near our home, hunting for squirrels. Behind our home was undeveloped mountain property of several thousand acres. There were old homes and farms on the mountain, long years ago abandoned when the families died and dependents moved away. Most of the land was purchased by timber companies and hunting and walks in the woods were okay. I had been taught at an early age in hunting methods and gun safety by my dad. He took me on exploratory trips into the woods to show me good places to hunt and blaze trails so I could find my way home. Dad was a very smart man and a wise father. He didn't want to find it necessary to search for me and lead me back home at night. One of these locations became my favorite. Very large beech trees filled with a little valley, and my access was one of the ridges that formed this place. There was a nice creek at the bottom of this ridge, and the babbling of water helped to cover the noise I made walking in. The trees were very tall, and the canopy was very full, making entry feel like walking into a large covered room. In the fall of the year, little red berries in the beaches made this place a favorite with gray squirrels. I adopted this place as my personal hotspot and mental relaxing den. Squirrels or not, I enjoyed spending time here, sitting on a log and admiring nature around me. Squirrel season opened around September 15th, and I could hardly wait each year for the season to open. A few classmates bragged of sneaking up before opening day and harvesting a few early. Not under Dad's watchful eye, I would follow the game laws or not be allowed to go all season. When opening day arrived during the 1957 or 58 season, I would rush home after school, grab my shotgun, and off I raced. After a few successful trips, I went to my personal spot one evening to find nothing at all. No squirrels, no birds, not anything was moving. After waiting an appropriate time in my 12-year-old brain, I decided to expand my territory, crossing the bridge across the stream in this area, the timber had been cut a few years back, leaving a few full trees and extremely thick undergrowth, bushes and briars. I found a game trail, an old logging road, circling the base of another ridge. It was quiet there, just like I had found earlier. Plus, the undergrowth was very thick, making eyesight limited. 
I had traveled two or three hundred yards off my normal route and found nothing to investigate. I decided to turn around and walk very slowly back the way I came in. If quiet, I might find game moving. As I got near the little bridge that would take me toward home, I heard an unusual noise. I listened carefully, but did not recognize the sound coming from the thick undergrowth. It sounded somewhat like birds or squirrels scratching in the dry leaves, looking for buried nuts or worms. I decided to investigate and determine the source of this rhythm noise. Dead leaves were very dry, making it very difficult to make any progress through the laurels, briars, and undergrowth without announcing my presence. I eased myself into the bush, making far more noise than desired. As I got closer to the noise, it got louder, but couldn't see the source. The brush I was entangled in was almost as tall as me. Finally, I parted the tangle in front of my face. I saw the source of the mystery. In front of me, lying on the ground, was an extremely large animal in deep sleep. This animal had been careful not to leave a trail into the thicket it was concealed in. Had I not heard the breathing noise, I would never have discovered this hiding spot. What I saw was this large animal lying completely surrounded by thick brush, weeds, and briars. It looked like a large rock that had been dropped into tall grass that gathered around all sides. The source of leaves being stirred was the breathing of this creature. With each breath, the leaves were blown around as it exhaled. I could see no movement of the animal other than breathing. The color of the fur, or hair, was cinnamon brown. I had seen cattle in this color, but this thing appeared to be larger than a cow. I tried hard to see more details, but was unable to see enough to eliminate guesses. It appeared this thing was lying straight down, with feet and legs folded up under it. It made a great effort to be concealed. The head and neck were pushed up under the bushes so it could not see details. Its breath was coming out under the bushes, near my right boot, but I was wedged tightly enough that I could not see. At least I knew which end was the front. All I could see well was the surface of the back. Considering bulk, I could see the body, I would estimate weight, in around the 700-pound range or more. I smelled no odor, nor heard any noise other than snoring. Please keep in mind, I was 12 years old and so excited my heart was trying to jump out of my throat. I was trying to determine what this animal was. In my range of knowledge, the only thing I could think of was a cow or bull. I brought my 20-gauge double barrel up to my front of my chest and began backing out one step at a time. I tried to form a plan of action if this thing woke up with me bound up in bushes. If it came at me, I had two barrels of number six birdshot. My plan was to shoot at the eyes, therefore blinding it and slowing it down. Better than no plan, I thought. Thank our good Lord, I got out of the thicket and back on a cleared path. As I started my walk toward home, it occurred to me I had crossed no fences. In fact, I did not know of anyone with a pasture close enough for cattle to wander into this area. In 1957 or 58, I had no knowledge of a Sasquatch or Bigfoot. I had not heard any stories or news about these creatures. Therefore, I did not consider them when this event took place. Thanks for joining me on the Bigfoot Project. I think you might find this video of interest as well. If you have a story you would like to share here, you can email me, Lynn Smith, at thebigfootproject at mail.com.